Little Britches, Father and I Were Ranchers. Chapter 11 Haying I liked working for Fred Altland. Haying and threshing were big times at his place, and he always had a dozen or so men to help him. Some of them were neighbors who didn't have so much hay of their own, and some were hired hands Fred brought out from Denver. Father and I didn't work for him until the hay was all cut and raked into windrows. I'd never seen a haystacker before, and Father had to snap his fingers at me twice during the morning because I got so interested in what was going on that I forgot about my own job. Fred's was what they called a bull stacker, and the hay was brought in from the fields with bull rakes. They were sort of three-wheeled carts and always looked as though they were going backwards because they scooted up the hay and carried it to the stacker in front of the horses instead of behind them. Each load weighed nearly half a ton. The stacker looked like the mast of a ship mounted on a big turntable with a long boom fastened near the bottom of it. The cradle was hinged at the end of the boom and pulley ropes ran between it and the top of the mast. Jeff was the engine that furnished the lifting power, and I was the engineer. Jeff was a big, lazy old horse, strong as a pair of oxen, and had been pulling the hoist rope for the past five years. As Jeff pulled on the rope, the hay was raised from the bull rakes and lifted nearly to the top of the mast. Then, while he held it there, Father and the other man heaved the turntable around and a long G-pole till the cradle was over the stack. When I backed Jeff to slacken the hoist rope, the cradle tilted forward and the load fell with a thump. It took Fred and two other men to get it untangled and built into the stack before another load was brought in. The only hard part of Father's job was heaving the turntable around, but that made him cough a good deal. After the first couple of loads, he talked to Fred about the stacker, and they sent a man to the barn for tools and other things Father needed. He worked between loads all morning, changing pulleys, rigging a heavy cable from the turntable to the hoist rope, and putting trip catches on the cradle. When he was finished, they didn't need to heave the turntable around anymore, nor lift the hay any higher than the top of the stack, and Father could drop the hay wherever Fred wanted it by just jerking a trip cord. In that way, Fred only needed one man to help him on the stack, and Father could do all the work on the ground alone. I liked noontime's best of any part of the haying. When it came 12 o'clock, Bessie would hammer on an old wagon tire hung near the kitchen door. The sound would roll out across the hay fields like the ringing of a big bell. And after it had stopped, the echo would come back from the hills as though they were full of far-off churches. The minute the bell rang, the drivers would stop their teams wherever they happened to be and unhook the horses. It was always a race to see who could get their team to the barn quickest so as to get them unbridled and fed and be first at the wash stand. It was out by the windmill, and Bessie always had three blue enamel basins, half a dozen flour sack towels, and a bar of homemade yellow soap waiting for us. Altlands had a big porch on the east side of their house with a row of apple trees that shaded it. In haying and threshing time, Bessie set a long table out there, and that's where we ate our dinners. At home, Father always served everyone and said grace before we started to eat, but that wasn't the way they did it at the Altlands. As soon as we were down at the table, Bessie would start bringing out big platters of meat and fried chicken and potatoes and vegetables and bowls of gravy and plates of hot biscuits and corn muffins. As quick as she'd set a platter down, somebody would pick it up, help himself, and pass it on to the next man. They came so fast that I could hardly help myself from one before another one got caught up to me. Some of the platters were still pretty heavy when they got to me, and I could just barely hold them with one hand while I forked some off with the other. At first, the men wanted to hold them for me, but they saw I didn't like them to, and let me handle my own platters. Mrs. Altland was a real good cook, and I used to eat until I couldn't hold another mouthful. 
The most fun came after we were done eating. We had to take an hour for dinner because the horses needed that much time to rest and eat. So as soon as the last piece of pie was eaten, the men would lie down on the grass under the apple trees. Father didn't smoke, but all the other men would get out their pipes or boulder them and talk or tell stories while they were smoking. Jerry Alder was the best storyteller. Sometimes he told stories so quiet I could hardly hear them, and they didn't sound funny at all. But all the men would laugh till the fat ones had to hold on to their stomachs. Even father laughed sometimes when I couldn't see anything funny. It was one of those noons that I found out about pheasants. There were lots of them, and they were so tame they'd come almost up to the haystack. I wanted to do some of the talking after dinner as the men did. So one noon, I told Fred that if I had a gun, I could shoot some of those pheasants for us to eat. And then his mother wouldn't have to kill so many chickens. Everybody laughed at me and Fred said, If you're going to do any shooting in Colorado, shoot a man. You can always call it self-defense. But if you kill a pheasant, you'll spend the rest of your life in the Hooskow. Fred Altland's haying lasted two weeks, Sundays and all. I remember the last day of that haying better than any of the others because so many things happened. The last day of haying or harvest or threshing is always the day when the most things happen. Maybe it's because everybody is happy if you had good luck, and if you didn't, everybody's glad it's over with. There was a fight after dinner that noon. One of the young fellows Fred brought out from Denver said something about Bessie that Jerry Alder didn't like. She had her back to us and was picking up the dishes and she was leaning over so far that her dress was real tight across her bottom. The Denver fellow was looking right at it, then he winked at Jerry before he said whatever it was. Anyway, it was an awful hard fight. The Denver fellow was the biggest man on the job, and Jerry the next biggest. The first sock Jerry hit him, Bessie ran into the house, and all the men got up on their feet, but nobody tried to stop them. The other two Denver fellows were nearest to where they were fighting. Fred and Carl Henry went over and stood by them, but they didn't say anything. The big Denver man didn't hit so often as Jerry did, but he hit a lot harder. He took a longer swing, and once he hit Jerry under the ear and knocked him down. I thought he was going to kick him while he was down, but Fred stepped in quick, and he didn't. Jerry rolled over and got right up again, and from there on, he fought just like a collie dog. He used his feet just about as much as he did his fist, but he didn't do any kicking like the other fellow. He'd go in quick and hit and be out again before the bigger fellow could hit back. And he went around that Denver man like a fly going around a lamp chimney. I guess the big fellow got kind of dizzy turning round and round trying to catch up with Jerry because he started looking pretty groggy. Then all at once, Jerry flew in with both arms working like the pitman rod on a mowing machine. He got his head right against the other fellow's wishbone and hammered him in the stomach till he went down yapping for air like a mud cat when you toss him up on the creek bank. After the fight, Fred took the three Denver fellows over to the bunkhouse and paid them off. But I don't think he ever said anything at all to Jerry for fighting. And as soon as he had washed the blood off his face and got his breath, you wouldn't have known Jerry had been in a fight except that his lips were kind of swelled up. He came back from the wash stand and started to tell stories almost before he'd found a place to lie down under the apple tree. With three hands short, it was late before we had the last load of hay on the stack, so Father and I stayed at Altland's for supper. When we were through eating, Fred told us to come into the house with him. We sat down by the table in the dining room, and Fred got out his checkbook. I knew Father didn't know how much he was going to get because I'd heard Mother ask him, and he just said, I don't know. I think he's paying the men he got from Denver a dollar and a half a day, but they're quite a bit stouter than I am right now. I hadn't wanted to ask Father what Fred meant when he told me he'd double the ante, so I didn't know how much I was going to get either, but I hoped he meant I was going to get 50 cents a day. After Fred got the ink bottle and a pen, he sat down at the table with us and asked me if I wanted to have a separate check or if he should make one check for Father and me together. I wanted it to be a big enough check that we could buy a cow, and I was proud to have my pay go in with Father, so I said for him to just make one check. He looked up at Father and said, All right then, Charlie. That'll make it a round sum. I figure Spike is worth twice what Liz Cochran was giving him. 
and you've saved me the wages of two men. Will $50 square the books? I was so excited, I didn't even hear what Father said, and he had to tap me on the arm before I remembered to say thank you. Father was as anxious to get home and show Mother the check as I was. He walked so fast, I had to trot part of the time to keep up with him. We hadn't gone very far before he noticed I was having to trot and scrooched down so I could get on and ride piggyback. I had always liked to have Father lug me piggyback before, and we were far enough from Altland's house so that I wasn't afraid anyone would see us. But for some reason, I didn't want to be carried that night. It just didn't seem right to be carried home when we were taking the check I'd helped earn. Father understood how I felt, and he walked slow enough so I didn't have to trot anymore. And he let me carry the check home to Mother in my overall pocket. It wasn't nearly so much fun in giving it to her as I had thought, because when we got there, our old white horse, Bill, was sick. He was breathing so hard, you could hear him all over the yard, and he was pounding his head on the barn floor. Father took one look at him and said, Blackwater, I'm afraid he's done for. Then he sent me kiting back to Altland's for a bottle of Spirits of Niter. And we'll read Chapter 12 next time. Until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for listening. I love you guys. Bye-bye.